Well, welcome everybody. We're now, we just had a really great round of introduction uh, with a bunch of new and old faces that have been engaging with today's reading, which is the book that's finally out, Money and Empire, Charles P. Kindleberger and the Dollar System by Perry Merlin. We're reading the introduction and chapters one, two, three, and four. That's what we read for today. Um, I have a feeling that we're gonna have a hard time getting through the entirety of the first half of this reading and we might have to re revisit that anyway. One thing I forgot to mention is that in addition to the money view um, discussions that are coming up in January, Perry will join us, uh, I think before Christmas, Alex has arranged for that to come uh, to join and discuss our questions or uncertainties about the book. Did you follow up with him? Yeah, he talked to me and okay, so he's gonna do it. So we can just schedule that right after we're done reading the book. Um, what I will offer now is maybe a very quick run through the chapters based on um, my notes, which I'm happy to share with you afterwards in case you're struggling with the reading, because I've done it, I've read it now twice, and it take, took me a long time to read, and this is typical of Perry, it's very dense, a lot of information in, a, in, 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 in these few pages, but a quick word on the origin story. Um, this book has basically been written as the direct follow-up project to the MOOC, um, which we all know. And uh, Perry has already mentioned this many times that the MOOC was missing an important essential piece, uh, which uh, of course the MOOC was written in this time when Perry wrote his previous book, New Lombard Street, and that was sort of biography of the Fed. So it's more of a national story. And so the international part was more an afterthought, but Perry continuously said that the thing has missed, uh, been missed in that in that book and also in the MOOC uh, was to really elaborate on this international story of the dollar. Um, and uh, that is a really key story. And I think this is really a valuable contribution to go through to use Charlie Kindleberger's life. And that's who he discovered, uh, who he sort of is hanging the story of the dollar uh, onto. Um, and that's what we're trying to explore uh, both Charlie's life and his perspective, but also the, of course, then the, the story of the dollar uh, and, and its importance in the international architecture as a consequence up until today. And um, what sort of shines through in this book is that actually today's world is actually very close to what Charlie Kindleberger imagined uh, we were working towards, which is one global system, a global integrated system based on a key currency. Uh, that's the key idea. And uh, that's not something that we should be objecting to. So right from the start in, in, in the introduction, um, Perry makes clear that the typical conversations that we have around monetary standards or international agreements like Bretton Woods is a is sort of a, a false start. We should not focus on these particular instances. We should be focusing on, um, on another set of ideas which have been uh, marginal at the time and continue to be marginal, but sort of keep on shining through through the market practice and the, the way the, the world has actually evolved. So Charlie has been emphasizing that. Um, I think that's something that's pretty clear uh, in the introduction part of, of things. So the introduction, um, if we quickly run through it, it already exemplifies a, a couple of things which uh, shine through in the entirety of the book, I would say. Number one, um, we're actually following Charlie's life, as I said, um, through um, the pre-war period uh, when, when he was a student, um, is his formation in, in chapter one as, as, as a child and, and teenager. Um, then his actual experience of going to, to school, going to, going to Columbia University, chapter two is super important for us to understand his teachers, his examples, like what is in his mind as, as the, the key sort of influences that make him believe uh, in what he does and give him the impetus to work on what, he, what he's working on. But I think what the introduction actually shows is sort of uh, spills over into the economic concepts quite clearly as well. Um, Perry spells out in the book that there are a number of like semi semi gods, absolutely fantastic leaders, in that have led through these various crises that have established the post war order um, in different parts of his life. So, for example, uh, Perry mentions. Uh, 
William Clayton, uh, George Marshall, the guy who wrote the Marshall Plan in the State Department, uh, Alan Sproul or Omar Bradley. These are all really important figures that he was directly working with that were leaders. And this, this the sense of leadership is something that is taking responsibility, uh, is something that's really important that we also will see in terms of um, the dollar standard, which is whoever's providing the, the dollar standard has to lead. Uh, that's sort of a, you have to assume the responsibility. And that's what the British uh, Empire was assuming previously. So if the if the, if we are on a on a on a sterling standard essentially, then the the British central bank has to assume the responsibility to uh, function as the, the backstop and as the liquidity provider for uh, that that area, uh, and not only take in national interest into account, um, it has to take the international interest into account, the global interest, um, and that is the case also, I think, for the for the for the dollar. Uh, he assumed that we have a lot of the interwar problems, the depression is a struggle of the US to take leadership uh, as uh, the UK no longer can assume the responsibility uh, and the US is not in a position to uh, or willing to assume the responsibility of backstopping uh, the system and uh, facilitating this dollar system. So those are basically sort of themes that the introduction gives us already sort of um, uh, an emphasis away from some sort of international agreement or some sort of an international accord uh, that inherit is inherently unstable if the leader does not stand behind it. Um, so actually the funny part that Perry Kett keeps emphasizing in the book and in different talks is the fact that yes, we didn't get the banker plan, we didn't get Keynes's idea, which was supposed to recycle surpluses uh, from the surplus countries into the deficit countries and so forth. Um, but we got something much, much larger in scale in the Marshall Plan. It was not because of the international agreement. It was because uh, actual leadership was, was taken by, by the State Department. So this is sort of a, a starting point we should keep in the back of our minds that things happen slightly differently than we have in, our, in the back of our minds. So let me just skip through a little bit the different chapters and give you a sense of the different chapters before we then go into deeply and, and discuss. So then this was the introduction, giving us the arc of the book. And uh, we're covering... Uh, what I didn't mention is that, of course, Charlie worked, uh, went to grad school, went to Columbia University, uh, had had uh, worked on international capital flows there, and sort of the banking aspect was already quite important there. Secondly, once the war started, he had a quick stint at the at the Bank for, for International Set Settlements that was just being created. Um, he he worked uh, on the tripartite agreement in 1933 to stabilize. The currencies, um, and then as the war actually unfolded and started, he worked uh, as a intelligence officer on the strategic bombing of Germany. So he had this incredible formation and moving around and had a very uh, formative time uh, in giving in, in service, uh, if you will. And so that's what the, this first half of the book is all about. Once he leaves, that's what the second half of the book is about. Once he leaves the service, the, the public service. He goes back to MIT. That's when we see him writing all these books. But what really is important is that we understand how his method is established through these different experiences. So this method is not the typical economic method that we that we have around, um, you know, mathematical optimization models, uh, linear algebra, and so forth. Um, he is using logic, uh, deductive reasoning, balance sheets. Uh, that's uh, basically how he operates and. He's not operating like a, Perry basically says he operates like an intelligence officer that tries to survey all kinds of information from all kinds of sources and tries to make some, some sense of it um, and, and create a narrative, a story around it that is uh, an open narrative, but is informed by real facts on the ground. So he's pretty much resisting the sort of flat econo economist line that he then later encounters in MIT. That's getting ahead of the story because that fight and that sort of uh, sort of his sort of loving marginalization at MIT that happened later on and his sort of uh, misfit if, in the economics profession we will discuss in the next in the next session. I think for now, I would like to just go back and start um, in, in each chapter um, and try to spend maybe maybe 10 or so minutes on each chapter uh, and then see, and then move forward and give us, our, us all a chance to reflect. Um, does that sound fine? Okay, so there's a lot yeah, to cover. Just, Go ahead, Alex. 
Yeah. Yeah. There's um, a lot of talk about capital flows here, and just the concept of a capital flow was something I struggled with for a while. Um, and I just, my sense is that a capital flow is just lending that happens internationally. So if you borrow, that's a capital inflow. And if you pay it back, that's a capital outflow. So then you have this situation where there's this long-term capital, which is like long-term borrowing and then short-term capital, which is like money market borrowing, like borrowing overnight in the Fed's funds market almost is kind of how we can think about it. Like you have surplus and deficit agents and they fill in the gap using this kind of short-term uh, borrowing, the short-term capital flows. Um, and then the, the longer-term kind of funded positions are the are the longer term capital flows. Um, so depending on how you look at these capital flows, if you net them out, you might not see like an expansion on both sides of a country's balance sheet. If they're both, you know, if they're borrowing short and lending long, that all nets out to zero. And, and something Kindleberger is emphasizing is, and a lot of economists are emphasizing is that activity is important. Um, and you don't wanna, you don't wanna necessarily lose that because it shows something about the stability of the international system. Um, so just kind of like having this idea of just banking International banking is capital flows in our minds. Uh, lending and borrowing is capital flows. Um, I think it's helpful as we kind of go through some of the thinking uh, that he has in this book. Is that just in the in the language of Charles P. Kindleberger? Is that generally in economics when people talk about capital flows? It's it's general economics, uh, capital flows. Um, and then there's there's the the so-called current account versus the capital account, which you hear about uh, in international economics. And the current account is, well, you're trading money for goods. And the capital account is you're trading money for borrowing, uh, someone's borrowing. So there's money flowing uh, because it's being borrowed as opposed to um, as opposed to it buying uh, goods and services. And then you hear this thing about, um, you know, the current in account and the capital accounts kind of canceling each other out by default in, in magnitude. Like if I, if um, China buys a bunch of goods from us, or maybe that's not a good example, um, but you, you could say hypothetically, if a foreign country is buying a bunch of goods from the United States, um, uh, and then, uh, or actually let's say, let's say it the other way around, let's say that, um, the United States is bunch, bar, buying a bunch of oil from, from Middle Eastern countries. Uh, that is a current account outflow from the United States to the Middle East. And then the Middle East is taking those dollars and lending them back to the United States uh, because they want to hold their dollars in the form of treasuries. So that is a capital flow back to the United States. So you have this kind of equal and opposite um, current account uh, uh, balance with the, with the capital account balance because the of the uh, trade uh, money for trade flows in one direction, and then the money wants to be stored as as assets, um, so the capital flows in the other direction. So the money flows there and back almost, um, but it flows there to buy the oil, and it flows back to buy the treasuries, and one one is a capital flow. And capital flow means international uh, borrowing Inter or lending, basically. International bar borrowing or lending, yeah. Okay. At least I mean, that's that's kind of my understanding. Well. Yeah. Oh, sorry, because sorry. you have foreign direct you, you have foreign direct investment or remittances flows and so on, which are not conceptually a form of borrowing, let's say. Yeah, I guess I guess in my head I think of uh, equity as a, as kind of a form of debt, like a residual debt that's owed to the owners. But you're right, uh, technically speaking, if you're thinking of 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 that kind of investment, that so some someone uh, sending money to buy to buy stock uh, to buy equity in a company would also be a capital flow. So uh, maybe I, I wasn't thinking about equity like in the stock market. I was thinking about like an actual investment, like a physical one. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I guess that's that's also a form of capital flow. Yeah. Yeah, I think just on this on this point, the introduction speaks to this point as well, which is um, when we take, of course, the 1945 as a starting point or Bretton Woods. Um, it's quite clear that we're talking about absolutely no private interaction whatsoever anywhere in the world. So it's only public flows. Perry makes that quite clear. And based on this notion, I mean, this is the, the notion that we're talking about. Um, this is this is this would be the starting point for um, for, of course, the, the environment in which the World Bank, the IMF, and Bretton Woods are created, right? Um, but the reality, of course, today is that we have primarily private flows. And that's where the, the bulk and the majority of, of the flows will actually happen. And this is the story that, that Charlie's actually 
concerned about. And that, that's the kind of um, world we actually see today as well, which is primarily a private, uh, is, is set on private interaction, private flows. And that's the, the thing that we see already in the introduction. Um, and I think the long-term project that's also spelled out uh, that, that uh, Charlie has in his mind is something that's quite interesting for our modern conversation as well, which is that um, the dollar system, the, the hegemon would have to provide for long-term, not short-term, but long-term capital flows into developing countries. So that, so that is basically the discussion that Charlie is engaged in. How can these long-term flows actually be 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 uh, be achieved, uh, and how and that have requires uh, leadership. It does not just happen through markets. One of the last notes I have: the markets don't solve anything by themselves. They require uh, some sort of leadership uh, to 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 get there. So I think this is quite an interesting point because I think it's a counterpoint to a lot of our our intuition we have in other heterodox discussions, which is to navigate through these international organizations or, or accords. And uh, and I think, and, and pro largely public, public sort of flows is what we're, we're a, lot of the, a lot of the conversations about. And this is an emphasis on how this can be, be achieved through private. And I think the order of magnitudes we're talking about are also much larger when it comes to private rather than, than public. I think this is really also something we uh, tend to underestimate that that is where the action is. Uh, and it's sort of getting getting lost sometimes in the conversations. And could this be understood in the sense when uh, Charlie has his controversy with Angelo, is I'm right, uh, about what is like balancing item of the balance of payment, whether it is it, it is gold and also the short term investments. Like I mean, the, usually. What I what I understood um, by the gold is like public investment of uh, public investments in short term would be much more like uh, private balance. Uh, is it is 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 it true in this sense? Yeah, I, th I think what you're bringing up is kind of um, if you if you imagine a world in which the money is gold, then you can think about a world in which okay, the the payments are in gold and. There's either goods coming in the other direction, or there's, um, or the the gold is like uh, an investment or something like that. So that, so the gold flows around. But what if your flows are not actually gold? What if they're you know IOUs for gold? If they're you know dollars, which originally are IOUs for gold, then should you think about that as um, a form of as a, as a kind of capital flow, or should you think about that as oh, it's really just money flowing, and we should kind of account for it like that? And I think that's the controversy there, right? And I think Kindleberger is arguing that, oh, this, this stuff is money. And especially once you're off gold, it doesn't really change how anything's working. Uh, you're still sending these dollars back and forth, but these dollars kind of are a form of credit. Um, so when do you think of them as flow as a money flow? And when do you think of them as a, a capital flow when the money's flowing the opposite direction? Yeah, I think this is already in chapter three discussed. This is a really important point that was brought up in chapter three, uh, one of the key concepts was to actually understand that both the, the first pound sterling and then the dollar were actually never a universal gold standard. Uh, the pound sterling, the UK was the only currency on the gold standard. The, the remaining countries were on the sterling standard. The same thing was true under Bretton Woods, that the US was on a gold standard and the rest was on a dollar standard. So this is an important point. Uh, brought up in chapter three, Hot Money, which basically says uh, under the gold exchange standard, which is a concept that was developed that we should, under the gold exchange standard, um, accept other currencies and not accept, not insist on gold for payment. Um, and this goes with, with Kindleberger's point that is re-emphasized that we should demonetize gold, which is don't, don't use gold for normal everyday transactions, uh, for commercial transactions. Don't expect that that is the, the means of payment. Uh, for 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 that type of transaction, and he has some uh, some other proposals that are quite interesting to sort of uh, sort of uh, create some sort of interesting exchange controls based on official flows versus private flows that are treated differently in terms of the means of payment that are acceptable for for these types of uh, ideas. But I kind of feel like Nicolas is the best person to ask about multiple exchange rates or multiple means of payment because uh, he's the Argentinian in the room. What do you think about that uh, particular concept? 
Um, I think I guess I will have to give more more thought to it. Um, yeah. So I'm and I'm also not quite familiar with how like the the Argentinian banking system worked like at the time of the gold standard, and uh, it was actually quite interesting to see that uh, what Williams's PhD thesis was actually about about that. So I will have to read it. Um, but yeah, like for international payments, you need dollars, and that's. Uh, I mean, there are alternative proposals out there, like to have like a um, South American currency or something like that. But so far, the truth of the matter is that uh, unless you have dollars in reserves or access to dollars somehow, then the the external constraint is binding, really. Exactly, and I think this is an important point. I think this is where also Charlie would start from, like if you don't have any sort of financial depth or borrowing capacity then, um, or a means of uh, finding alternative means of payment, then you're really constrained. Exactly, these constraints are manifested in the interwar period or other periods when there's lack of trust or lack of financial integration where you cannot settle in, in many, uh, many different forms and you have to settle on something that's ex extremely scarce. Uh, this dollar shortage is something that, that he discusses in a 1950s paper um, and, and brings up again and again. I think it's something, there have to be enough means of payment uh, in the system. And this is a repeated, Repeated, repeated theme throughout the book that um, we can get the, the chapter two in a second where uh, Henry Parker Willis, his, his, his mentor was, was also um, making sure that for the US system, the British, the British um, central banking model will not work because the US has a seasonal fluctuations in the money supply uh, or money demand. And so we have to find a way to unfix the money supply to accommodate that particular dynamic. But we're getting ahead of, ahead of ourselves quickly I want to give us quickly a chance to look at chapter one. I think that's actually worth me just reading off my notes because it, this is almost entirely bi biographical. Uh, so chapter one is Golden Boy. It says basically that uh, Charlie was born on uh, the 12th of October, 1910. Was son of an up and coming lawyer and uh, socially amb ambitious wife. Was he grew up actually just a couple blocks from where I'm sitting right now, which is Washington Square Park. Um, that's where NYU currently is, uh, just uh, ten blocks from the INET office. He grew up as a wasp, which uh, is of course a type of um, you know you uh, American style. White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, Perry mentions in chapter one that he's a sailor and he also wrote in his retirement, uh, which we'll get into all his writings in re retirement, he wrote a book called Mariners and Markets, which sort of brings together his two big loves in life, uh, sailing and economics. Um, when he was a teenager, I think they moved to Flushing, New York, which is in Queens, it's in the outskirts of New York, uh, a bit further away, and there basically there was a family lunch uh, every every Sunday, people dressed up and it was sort of a, a thing. And he had a lot of sisters. He was a middle child. Uh, he had a lot of mothers and sisters. So his father apparently was reading not just one, but multiple newspapers a day. So just constantly reading and having his head everywhere. Um, yeah. And then he went to different schools, uh, Kent School. Um, his father wanted him to become a lawyer. That's why I eventually went to University of Pennsylvania. Um, and there he joined the rowing team. Okay. So, but when he entered, he entered uh, as a classics major, uh, which means he read literature and philosophy and uh, learned Greek and, and Latin, but then pretty quickly switched to economics and never looked back. Basically that happened at, at UPenn. Um, he had a friend back then, Emil Dupre, who comes up later in the book more and more, who's really important. And if you are in, in international economics, his name will come up a lot as well in the reading. I've just re recently come across a great book. But Emil, Emil Dupre, I think, went to school with him. I can't remember exactly, uh, but he was related to him. But he was more brilliant in some sense than, 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 than him. He went to Harvard, um, and then he also went to the Fed. So actually, Charlie wanted to go to the Fed and didn't get in. Uh, so he had some lowly other job, and I don't know what happened exactly, but he didn't uh, get what he wanted right away uh, to work at the Fed. Uh, then he went to Columbia College and lived at 434 Riverside Drive, which coincidentally, one of my best friends lives there now in, in the same street, not in the same house, but it's right up on the 
uh, up at Columbia University. So that's kind of funny. So that's chapter one, just gives us a little bit of a backdrop, what his family was like and, and where he grew up. So uh, that, that is really quite interesting. And we get already a flavor of the character he has, which is that of a, of a wasp. Then chapter two, I think is really getting in, into a lot of meat. And I think we should maybe slowly walk through chapter two because chapter two, Columbia University, him being a grad student, really we have to unpack that a little bit to understand exactly where his ideas come from and what, what are the urgent issues of the time. Um, we can all chip in here. I'm not going to try to. I'm not going to try to do this by myself here, but I think what I really, really love is already how it starts. Right? It says curiosity is the strongest drive. And I think this was really quite, quite interesting. Um, that for Charlie, curiosity was a bigger urge than trying to change the world. Right? He says we first have to understand the world before we are, we try to. Uh, to, to change in it or operate within it. And uh, in this, on a separate note, I don't know, Adam Tooze has always been, he's been all over this book, uh, but in a, separate, uh, in a separate podcast, Adam Tooze was raving about Marx uh, for the exact same reason, which is Marx actually attempted to understand the system first before he attempted to critique it. He really was deep into understanding the neoclassical model and the economy before he was sort of putting at least that was that i'm not putting these two things in the same category i'm just saying this sort of is in the same the same spirit of first understanding but then later of course mark says philosophers are here to change the world you know um or something like that i forget the exact quote but um you can you guys can help me I didn't marx do the communist Manif manifesto before he went on his whole like economics research stuff I'm just here quoting twos. I'm not going to make any more okay. statements, but let's not let's not confuse these two guys. Uh, they're very different. But I just thought it's it's really what I want to say is that Charlie was really just curious about how stuff works. You know, he really just wanted to know how things work, and his urge was not to somehow uh, find a silver bullet or some sort of utopia. Um, maybe there was. It, it is now real, but I think that was sort of maybe the, the, what the, at least Perry's making it clear in this in this introduction that curiosity is what drives him. Okay, um, does anybody else want to attempt at starting what stood out to you in chapter two at Columbia University? There's a lot here. Now, you, those of you who haven't read, you can follow along my notes, but it's quite quite a lot here to unpack. Yeah, so I think, I think one of the big things is, um, this is page 44, um, it's talking about how James Angel uh, thinks about the mechanism of self-regulation of the of the international monetary system, and he talks about um, how the relevant mechanism is not the flow of gold, but rather the operation of the market for foreign exchange, uh, and in particular the shifting balance of importer and exporter bills, which has an immediate effect on short-term interest rates, and also, so he proposes, on the total volume of purchasing power, uh, meaning bank credit. So this is short-term capital flows. This is um, IOUs for gold that are moving around uh, quickly to um, kind of fill in gaps and stuff like that, um, rather than the gold actually flowing itself. Uh, and this kind of relative to what we were talking or related to what we were talking before, um, it's it's showing that you know it's a it's a mechanism that's there that doesn't go away when you get rid of kind of the gold backing of everything because there's still going to be short term capital flows. So I, I thought that was an important point um, and that he kind of got that from from James Angel. And uh, I've read about the uh, proposal of uh, Charlie, but I don't remember if in this chapter of. Uh, in the next about uh, a two tire exchange system uh, on the upper tire the there would be an official rate uh, with uh, uh, which measure the trade balance flows and on the uh, down tire the uh, private uh, flows uh, al al most speculative flows and uh, I'd, I'd like to ask you if you uh, no, if you figure out something more uh, specific about about that how would would it work this uh, two tire uh, exchange system if you I don't know if you have uh, 
would focus it work of that particularly. Would it work to do what exactly? Uh, well, I don't know, actually. But I, I think uh, it is uh, an idea to to stabilize the the um, on the one end the, to stabilize the the dollar, and uh, uh, he, he wrote it uh, in the hot money in uh, 1938. This is uh, the the chapter about hot money, and uh, he wrote uh, an article or a book. I, I don't I don't remember hot money in 1938. And uh, he wrote, uh, uh, he, fig he figured out this idea of a two-tier exchange system. I think uh, he, he, he would stabilize the dollar, the, the exchange rate of the dollar. On the one hand, uh, uh, splitting the, the, the exchange rate. On the one hand, the, the trade, the trade uh, <coughs> uh, balance flows. And on the other end, the speculative flows that were uh, private. So like having two exchange rates. Well, that's it. Yeah, I have, I have it here in my notes too. I can just highlight this. This is basic for those of you who cannot find it in the book, but this section here, I'll mark it in yellow. So basically, I read up my notes here. So it's basically... Um, you are right. It's sort of a form of exchange control. That's the idea. Um, a system based on less expensive counters, which is flat foreign exchange, less expensive than gold, which is um, the important thing was to prevent short-term capital flows from destabilizing exchange, two-tier exchange system, official dollar to be kept stable by official gold flows. So official dollar, uh, we have to define what that is, but just say, keep that in mind. The official dollar is stabilized by official gold flows mm -hmm. and private dollar allowed to fluctuate. So that means this dollar does not have, um, does not stay at par with the official dollar if there is a problem. If there's a speculative attack or there's a speculative inflow, this is not guaranteed that this private dollar will stay at par with the official dollar. The idea was to channel <laughs> short capital flows into private market in effect, absorbing the pressure of speculative inflows and outflows in the fluctuating price of the private dollar while maintaining a stable official rates for foreign tr trade purposes. This would provide a system of foreign exchange control sorting out the commercial from the hot money transactions with none of the usual administrative details and, and difficulties incident to the most to most foreign exchange controls. So that's so this basically, would be, yeah, that's that section. This would be similar to the greenbacks during the Civil War where they had um, this, I guess it wasn't private money, but it was money that was not the, uh, it was IOUs for a certain amount of gold. So it was dollars, but they didn't, they weren't redeemable right away. And they weren't redeemable until, you know, many years later after the, the crisis was kind of averted. Is that a good analogy, would you say? No, like perhaps, uh, yeah. I mean, um, I can comment based on, on Argentina. So Argentina has a lot of exchange controls. Uh, and it's quite messy how the system works, but um, in a quite simple way, you could have like a commercial exchange rate and a financial one, like uh, as proposed by Charlie here. And for instance, if you are an importer that wants to, uh, or maybe you're a producer, you have an auto company and you need to import auto parts, then you go to the central bank and you ask for a certain amount of dollars to import them. And since you are using those dollars for a productive purpose, then you access those dollars at the official rate, which is relatively cheap, let's say. Uh, but then if you want, if you demand dollars for other purposes, like not related to production, or you know, maybe you want dollars to save in your house uh, as a means of saving, or you want to use those dollars to speculate in whatever financial thingy, then uh, you can buy dollars, but you will not be able to access at the same exchange rate than the, the commercial importer wants. Uh, can access to to exchange rate, so you will have to pay more local currency in exchange for those dollars, and then you have a differentiation between the commercial exchange rate and the financial ones. But of course, these systems are kind of hard to regulate, and in practice, you know, well, at least in the case of Argentina, we currently have like 13 different exchange rates, which is, as you can imagine, quite complicated. And so, um, but I mean. 
uh, a system of two exchange rates will actually be feasible, I will argue. Is that 13 different exchange rates with the US dollar or 13 different exchange rates with different with, currencies? With the US dollar, yeah. Wow. So for instance, if I want to go abroad and uh, you know, I, I go to the US and I make purchases with my credit card in the US, then I have a given dollar, which is quite different from the dollars that, that importers of real goods can buy, uh, which by the way, have to ask for permission to the central bank. Um, or the dollar that I would access if I were to trade in bonds, or you know the dollar that I would get if I'm a um, soy exporter, which soy is a big sector in Argentina. And so overall, you have 13 different ones. <laughs> yes, perhaps uh, is that this idea in in the rhythm of uh, Kindleberg? Yes, it's possible. I think. But I mean, just uh, to emphasize the key idea, um, it does make sense to have one cheap exchange rate for those that, I mean, for a country like Argentina, you have a given amount of dollars. You cannot get more dollars than the ones that you can get, basically. And so you have to, as a government, I will argue, you have to prioritize who gets access to those dollars. And it's not the same that, uh, and, someone who is importing things to produce and to you know, um, hire people and so on and so forth, than someone who wants to use those dollars kind of to save them or you know, to speculate or whatever. So it does make sense at the conceptual level to, um, to grant the importer a cheaper um, you know, exchange rate than the one for the speculator, let's say. Yeah, historically, uh, in Czech Republic, after the liberalization, it was kind of similar because there was like one uh, official exchange rate for the uh, for the producer from, for the importer, where they can uh, get dollars from uh, central bank, and there was the other for like uh, I don't know for con consumers when they wanted to buy the new pair of right uh, jeans or something like this, and it was different and. In a particular time, maybe I think that the the second one, uh, just for the cons for the consumption or whatever, water, was uh, sometimes like only on the black market, or it wasn't like possible to even get uh, dollars uh, officially. Yeah, in Argentina it's actually the same. Like uh, a person can buy up to two hundred dollars per month legally, uh, and if they can show that they, you know, have sufficient economic capacity to. So you you need to earn a certain amount of money to uh, to get access to those two hundred dollars. But beyond that, there are you know illegal markets where you can get dollars, of course, uh, much more expensive. Yeah, and I I think the Celine, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to chip in because when I read. Or when I read your notes, this this passage that you highlighted in yellow, it made me think a little bit of you know this uh, dual system that it, it, uh, we have in China. You know, you have the onshore and the offshore renminbi. So 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 the basically, I mean, my I'm not an expert on this, but my understanding is that the onshore is um, on. Um, only restricted to mainland Chinese, yeah, to mainland China, uh, and the exchange rate there is 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 managed uh, by by the PBOC, so the the People's Bank of China, um, and uh, yeah, you cannot. It's very hard to take take it out. If I don't even think it's possible. And then you have the offshore renminbi. So this is what is traded in Hong Kong, and it's uh, you know it it has a free free. Uh, exchange rate, so it's a floating exchange rate, and there it allows. Um, basically, that's how uh, foreign investors can uh, invest in China, and and obviously you have different prices uh, of money there. Um, I don't know if we have an expert in YSI on this, but. Um, I would be interested in knowing how it works, <laughs> but it, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to share that it, you know, by reading your passage, I don't know if it, I mean, it's probably different context and whatnot, but um, I think with the Argentinian case and with the Chinese case, there are variations of the, uh, you know, 
two-tier exchange rate systems that, or you know, 13 tier, I don't know, that exist already today. Yeah, I think this this is a hot topic. Um, I mean, I I'm familiar with it through Germany in the 1930s. There was there were the these exchange controls as well. And Germany was actually, if you look just above 1933, the World Economic Conference was targeting Germany to stop the exchange controls because obviously we should remember that this is these this memo was a consequence of the lack of a proper system working internationally. So this is a consequence of uh, lack of central bank coordination. Um, so this is the second best solution. So this is basically, uh, we should not adopt this as a sort of a, a way forward uh, to strive for. Um, so I would, but that, that sort of maybe gives us a quick chance to sort of, um, I wanna make two things. I wanna go back to chapter two, but here is, I think, uh, back coming back to Perry, the four prices of money, what we're, what he's breaking here is the par relationship between the private dollar and the official rate. And the, the, that that's something he, we should not try to attempt to stabilize. There's something, this comes back to the key currency idea. You have to stabilize the core and let the periphery fluctuate. Um, this idea we'll see over and over again, that this is uh, reflected here in this idea as well. Um, so, this is uh, something to keep in the back of our mind that this idea of stabilizing the key currencies uh, is at the core of his ideas and that we should uh, not try to stabilize everything at all times. Uh, that's not possible. So this is uh, part of that conversation. But I think it's a good segue to get back to chapter two because that gives us a little bit of the setup for all these ideas because chapter three, hot money, is we're in the hot mess, which is the interwar period. It's really difficult to even understand all the different historical instances, but I think we get, in a, we get a perspective in chapter two, at least, what is actually the ideal maybe that uh, Charlie strives towards and where he's getting that from. And maybe um, in chapter two, one of his important heroes that we should emphasize is Henry Parker Willis. And that guy was important because he was sort of there for the establishment of the very first attempts of creating a federal reserve system in the US. And that is important because first of all, we have to understand that the British central banking model does not fit well on the US. Why? Because US is a developing country. US is uh, a dynamic economy that uh, needs um, business loans. It needs long-term capital investments. It needs very different things than what the British economy prior was, was doing, which is based on money market instruments, self-liquidating loans. If you look, read Badgett, that's basically what's, what's happening. That, Whatever credit is is there, like it's usually bills of exchange that liquidate within three months, that is close to money, and that is sort of becoming money. So these whatever credit exists in that sort of system becomes money in a very short period of time, and then you have a system built around making that system stable and and creating liquidity around that system. Uh, if if there's a if there's a if there's a run or something, it's a very different thing than what we have in the U.S. economy which is based on liquid, uh, illiquid long-term bonds, assets that cannot be liquidated or don't, are not self-liquidated. They're gonna sit there on your balance sheet for five, 10, 15 years, not three months. So that that's introduces the idea of liquidity that is shiftability. You have to be able to sell the asset, not have somebody guarantee, like accept your bill of exchange, which is simply guaranteeing that, that uh, the risk will be paid by somebody else in case somebody defaults. It's a very different problem than having to actually sell the asset into a market to get money out of it. It's a fundamentally different problem. So this is already, Henry Parker Willis is aware of this. If the US is built on, needs to already uh, deal with this. But this is also why the attempt of creating the Fed, of having all these different regions, uh, diff 13 different clearing regions clear together that was the big project, the Federal Reserve Act, and that was what he attempted to, to do. Uh, he was trying to implement something called the Real Builds Doctrine, because this is an even re more real problem, if you will, than in the British case. What real builds in this case are the same thing what we just talked about, which is things that are credit that is used for direct output for production uh, and will lead to sales quickly, and there, therefore money comes back into the accounts quickly. So that's real builds doctrine. That is sort of the real money. The rest is sort of not within the sort of really stable sphere. And that's what he actually didn't want to get into, uh, base a banking system or a Federal Reserve. 
that's uh, on something else he didn't want to. So he was focused on this real builds doctrine. Um, and Charlie sort of distanced himself later from that, from that idea, especially for the US, it didn't make sense in the US to think about that in those categories. So long story short, um, we do get a Federal Reserve Act, which ties together these different regions of the US through having 13 you know, branches that are sort of tied together through a board um, that we can get into. Um, they were supposed to be built on real bills that should be reserved. These real bills should then be reserves to the banking system as a whole. So these real bills should not be long-term uh, assets on the balance sheet of these reserve banks with short-term bills that self-liquidate. Um, that system goes out the window pretty quickly. Why? Because World War I puts com completely different demands on the Federal Reserve, which is then the government is starting to place a lot of government bonds and treasuries into the market that are then being stabilized by the Federal Reserve. So it's the exact opposite system than what the Federal Reserve was initially built on. Um, and Henry Parker Willis is trying to undo this, uh, this thing because it's completely counter to his intuition because having the Fed sitting with these, with these bonds that they cannot liquidate that you know, are just gonna sit there and not become money right away uh, is something that's really counter to his intuition. So that's just something to understand. We get a very different Fed. The Fed is established and almost immediately, it's the complete opposite from what we, uh, what, what, what the, the founders of the Fed had intended for. And then the interwar period is a period where there are attempts to sort of get maybe um, back to that original system with those fail. That's Henry Parker Willis, so it's my best attempt. But the key idea here that we have to consider is Henry Parker Willis was about economic integration of the different currency areas into one economic unit. And the war actually does bring that. The war effort brings one money market that's integrated across the entirety of the US and one capital market based on the US treasury bills and government bonds. And what, you know, these assets are placed by the government creates one unified market. That's the one thing that, that perpetuates actually this unification of the monetary system in the US. And this is basically also what, what Charlie picks up later. This is his model for how he sees the world, that we have one world currency, uh, one world money market, one world uh, capital market. That's sort of the, the template that, he, that, we, that we get for. And that's the, the, that's the best version we can, we can ask for. But that's, of course, we have other, 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 other problems that come with that that we can discuss, but they're quite obvious what those problems are. But that would be the most effective economic way of, of achieving economic integration in the world uh, and, and having one world central bank essentially that would manage the system uh, would, was, was his, his idea basically to sort of knit the world together in this particular way, similar to his mentor, Henry Parker Willis. Alex, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, an interesting aspect of what uh, the Fed was trying to do and what, what Willis was trying to do is that you had a country that already did have a single monetary standard. Everybody was on the dollar and the dollar had a single mint par. Wherever you go, the dollar is defined the same way. They didn't have par clearing between the different regions. So depending on which dollar instrument you were holding, you might not get a full dollar for it, depending on the context, that kind of thing. But there kind of was one currency. And I think one of the things that Kindleberger is emphasizing is that there is one international currency too. Uh, and he's trying to knit together the banking, but there already is kind of a single international monetary standard. Um, and kind of how he thinks about the global economy, he's thinking about it, uh, and I think Perry says this in the book somewhere, but he thinks about it as like a giant domestic economy that, that covers the whole world and it's got a single currency. And you start by thinking about it like that. And then you have these individual nations that each have their own kind of domestic currencies. And you add that complexity on to this international system with a single currency. So he wants to create um, uh, a unified, stable kind of banking arrangement uh, based around the single standard that it, the international economy is already on. And in that sense, there's a, there's an analogy to be had with the Federal Reserve be, because it, it already is one, one currency in the United States. Yes, yes. Um, 
Yeah, so I wanted to come back to one thing you said, Jay. Um, does he explain, or because you say that basically the war brought, you know, unified basically the, the international money market or capital markets. US market. Um, ah, okay. Ah, okay, okay. Then... We're talking um, about US economy, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think then this makes, yeah, this clarifies, thanks. But the, yeah, but the war is problematic in many other ways. We should really get into what breaks come with the war that really throw up a bunch of questions that are that we have to deal with uh, in the remainder of chapter two and three. Uh, it's not in four, of course, too, because that deals with the war specifically, what happens in the war. But there's a lot of stuff to talk about here. Ma Marianne, you were trying to call Yeah, um, Jade, there is also uh, really interesting thing about the uh, role of the interest, interest rate of the Fed um, uh, in the transition period uh, in the 1914. Like uh, when he mentioned that the, before the war, the Fed has like interest rate around uh, 1% or half, half of the percent. So for the, for the uh, US people, it was uh, like, it, it, it was good to like borrow money to buy the government bonds and they're just on the credit. So therefore the support uh, the, the war uh, bu budget. And, but after the, after the war, the Fed went up with the interest rate up to 7% or something like this. So then it was like, uh, it was kind of problematic because, because before the war, the holding of the government bonds was actually like uh, you get money out of this, but after the war, it wasn't that uh, like uh, good for the holder. Am I right? Yeah, I think. Yeah. But let me quickly explain exactly the point you're making is exactly right. This is actually the reason uh, why the capital markets became unified in the United States is exactly the interest rate policy that the that was implemented. What happened specifically is that the interest rate for public for, for, for private borrowing was lower than the coupon rate of the US uh, government debt, which basically incentivized a lot of private actors like normal people, retail investors to borrow and then buy government debt and get and basically arbitrage. But this, the consequence was that everybody was holding the government debt in one market. It unified the entire capital market of the United States uh, in the, in the, with, this, with this action. Um, now, what happens so, after a war is a different story, right? It's, go ahead. But pardon. So they actually created the capital market. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, a national one. I mean, the capital market always existed in, it's hard for us to understand nowadays that Money does not necessarily clear easily in different parts because it happens so automatically. We have to ask Celine uh, why that's so easy nowadays that we have a euro, uh, an Italian euro, be exactly the same as a German euro, and I think we have we have our back end uh, ways of, of of ensuring that it's not it's not always so clear that that is the case. I mean, this knitting together of the system uh, re is required for the system to for these par relationships to actually hold. And to have a unified market is also not something that's natural. It's sort of especially for a country as wide uh, as the United States. So after the war, obviously, we come to another problem, which we were jumping ahead. But just to preface this is that um, the modern day open market operations are built on the shiftability concept, the buying and selling of of capital assets. It's not the shift. It's not the liquidity idea that we originally had in the 19th century. It's buying and selling of assets, stabilizing the bond market. And originally it was stabilizing the government bond market because that had to be, once people were, as you were saying, unloading, you know, um, unloading these, these government bonds, somebody had to buy them in, in the pinch. When there was a, when there was a weird market, the, the Fed had to step in to stabilize that market, right? So that was, that was the origin of what we nowadays call open markets operation, open market operations. But a lot of these displacements are also core concepts that we should bring in because I think this is also maybe Kindleberger's story or Perry's version of Kindleberger's story for why we have inflation currently. Like 
uh, what 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 the, the story we, we we tell ourselves might might be very well told in a Kindleburgian sense because we are basically in an in a displacement uh, that is post-war, which in this case displacement means that we uh, we have a lot of shifting around of resources which are not yet in their best place economically speaking, and that takes a number of years before they actually can go back into place where they're where they're they're best used. And that's best. The pandemic is a classic example because. We had people moving from one place to another and supply chains being disrupted. That is sort of a very similar dynamic as what happens in a war economy and going out of a war economy requires time for adjustment. Um, and that's something that uh, he gets into, into in, in a later chapter. Okay, I'm looking at the clock. So we have like 20 minutes left. Um, maybe just a look at chapter two. There's of course, uh, Alex has already brought up uh, Angel, um, James Waterhouse Angel, who's another role model. Um, I think what's really quite interesting there is that um, he was working directly with Alan Young, who is also a hero of Perry's. Perry wrote a biography of Alan Young, who's also one of the founding members. But the key thing, he was an internationalist um, and he recognized sort of this enlarged US role in international trade and finance. And we have to understand that US was really isolationist at the time. The US taking an active role internationally was not a natural uh, natural uh, predisposition. And what he was mostly, so this, this of course means that US is shifting from a net debtor to a net creditor country. Um, and the US is basically both producing things for the world and giving people the money so they can buy those things from the US. So that's essentially what's happening in the, in the, in the war. So this is both production and credit that shifts the US position from net debtor to net creditor. So what, what Angel, uh, can, Angel, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah can I just, uh, I, this is very important, I think, in, and if there's someone from Poland on the call, there are some amazing things happening in Poland now because they are in the EU, they have their own currency, they are investing 2.5% of GDP in war material because of the war, and they are buying that from US and maybe Korea, South Korea, but mainly there. So, so I mean, if, if you want like a reflection to the current event, this is a, a lead to follow, I think. I haven't, I just saw the headline, one article in FT, but like this is a current example of what I think and understand the similarities with uh, uh, the, the, the functioning of the, of the Marshall and yeah, the whole thing we will read through later on. Sorry, I just had to make this point. Yeah, the beautiful thing is we'll see parallels all over um, with current or current times once you're a student of history. Maybe just to finish off chapter two, and I, I just wanna make sure we cover these important points. So um, was that obviously we're dealing in the world of the classical doctrine, which is the gold standard doctrine of, of the time. And Angel was sort of concerned how much of this sort of thinking should we keep for this new environment, right? That was the thing. He was active in this project of trying to reconcile classical theory with these new the, with these new problems. I'm not going to get into details here, but I think um, it's really worthwhile that he's attacking two important concepts that were standard at the time. One is the species flow mechanism. Um, we should all know it. Maybe I'll give you a quick review just uh, just so we understand it. The basically home country imports more than it exports. So I buy more from abroad than I'm exporting back, which means I need to pay that in gold, which means there's a net outflow flow of gold from my country to the other. Problem with gold is that gold is both part of my domestic money supply and the means of payment internationally. So now with me losing gold, I lower prices at home uh, and I raise prices abroad because it's part of their domestic money supply as well. This uh, changes the terms of trade and induces exports uh, and imports in the other direction and creates balance. Okay, that's the theory, the species flow mechanism. Okay, we can overview that. But um, basically, uh, Angel says this thing is, is broken. This mechanism does not work any longer. And he basically makes an important uh, observation here, which is that this mechanism is not reliant on the flow of gold, but what happens is driven by what's happening on the foreign exchange markets, which is shifting bank balances, uh, balances of importer and exporter bills, uh, and it therefore is influenced by the short-term interest rates, bank credit, 
and therefore uh, bank credit is, a, is the overall driver of purchasing power. So it's a banking story, he would say, that's driving this, um, uh, this story, not, not the classical uh, sort of flat theory that we have. So that's, that's off the table. And there's a second theory that he attacks coming from the classical uh, doctrine, which is the purchasing power parity. And that means simply that our exchange rates simply reflect our relative price levels and he thinks that is also completely uh, not relevant anymore. Um, I just want to point out that these two theories are, are being discussed in chapter two. And one more thing that is relevant with Angel is that he's dealing with another important, um, and that is um, that what these people around Kindleberger that influenced Kindleberger were really concerned about was the private side of things. And we keep on emphasizing these public, the entire interwar period is a public sort of um, political payments, uh, political dynamics, this carries into the war, but the the young plan and, and other plans, the, the, the German reparations have to be commercialized. These, the way things stabilize is through private flows in the 1920s in, in, into Germany. Those are based on commercialized German reparations payments. That's why the BIS is brought into, into existence too. So the only way that this system stabilizes is what these people are emphasizing is the private uh, part of things. So I just wanted to put that out in our, in our head because this is always something that Perry already in this course was talking about, but Kindleberger reinforces that through his economic history as well. All right, so that's what I have for you of chapter two. If you guys want to chime in, we have a couple minutes maybe to fill in on that or discuss these points. I just wanted to comment on purchasing power parity. Um, there's this, I think in the, in the book, he talks about it kind of being connected to the species flow mechanism, um, sort of like the, uh, the, the gold flows will cause the change in price levels, that kind of thing. But even if the species flow mechanism isn't, you know, really what's determining price levels, um, you got to think that there's at least going to be some kind of arbitrage on tradable goods. Like if something costs 100 times as much, uh, you know, in in one, if you're if you're you know getting in one currency versus another, uh, you'd think someone would kind of come in. So, so there's got to be some kind of purchasing power parity constraint internationally, right? Maybe it's not not like perfect, but it's you know it's going to if if the purchasing power parity purchasing powers get far enough apart from each other, you're going to start having, you know, gold flows and you're going to start having some kind of arbitrage, right? It's kind of logically speaking. Yeah, I guess my intuition would say, yes, in theory, that sounds right. But in practice, you have, especially in this dislocated, where you don't even have a market, that's the whole point of, of, of chapter, is it chapter four? I can't remember, which we have to look at my notes again. But the fact is that if you don't even have the markets to actually do this arbitrage, then you don't even have, you cannot even get, get into conversation. So we have to sort of see where these pockets are. How can people actually reach across these? Um, the fact that we, we don't have private interaction actually uh, breaks down all these concepts, which are basically completely market uh, ideas, right? In some sort of magic way, we don't even think about it, but this is now a time when you have to really construct a market or, or facilitate a market. And what he said, emphasizes later is, of course, that we have to use the public as a as an anchor, then have the private be built on that, basically. Right. So that's, the, of course, our banking yeah. logic as well. But um, this thing does not exist or this thing breaks down completely if we don't even have markets, which is something we are we have to be aware of that this is something we have dislocation, which also means we don't have fluid markets. We don't have a way of getting, um, for example, like this, this concrete example that I would give is exactly what we talked earlier about, which is the dislocation after a war means that you have tremendous amount of pressure to offload uh, treasury bills into what? Who's buying? Nobody's buying. There's no market. So then you have to create a market. So the public has to step in, create a market or stabilize a market. And then, then it sort of goes, then you have private actors coming in helping you, but it's not something that's automatic, right? Uh, it, it's something we have to understand that these markets have to be in place for these arbitrage relationships to, to hold. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, then my other comment is um, if the gold flows, if the reason why the gold flows are happening is as a result of 
governments trying to maintain monetary stability or fixed exchange rates or something like that, then that kind of negates the, the specie flow mechanism as well, because the gold is just kind of like the inventories that the central banks maintain, uh, and not just gold, but the foreign exchange as well. Is It's true about that, that if, if these flows are all happening for the purpose of maintaining stability in the international monetary system, then it can't be that they're the cause or... or they're either going to be the, the cause of, of, of some instability or the flows are going to be the result of, of mechanisms that are that are stabilizing, that are intended to stabilize or something like that, right? Does that make sense? Maybe not. Um, what I'm imagining is that you know, there's these different central banks, these different countries that have reserves, and they're trying to maintain exchange rate stability with each other. They're trying to maintain their mint parity, and sometimes as a result of that, uh, in order to maintain convertibility, in order to keep your exchange rates where you want them, uh, there have to be flows of of uh, of foreign exchange or flows of gold uh, in order to compensate for any other shocks that might happen internationally. Yeah, I think this is a pretty good segue into chapter three, where I think there's a concrete example for this. But Claudio, before I dominate the the conversation. No, yeah, I was thinking that uh, what is matter are uh, the interest rates of uh, the, the central banks, because uh, if uh, arbitrage uh, didn't work, but uh, central banks uh, acted uh, through the interest rates so when the, the flow when gold or uh, the, the the or there were a, a commercial deficit uh, interest rate uh, uh, increased and uh, there was a deflation mechanism that uh, uh, push a rebalance uh, of the toward the equilibrium yeah, and those changes in interest rates are are part of how um, are part of what would, would induce a, a flow of foreign exchange or or gold or capital flows in general. Yeah, and I think this is a good segue to chapter three because what you guys are talking about is okay, price is one, but quantity is another, and we have to ensure that actually the balance actually happens with quantity transfer, which in the back end comes back to chapter three is all about stabilization, right? Uh, in a time where these things are not happening in the right way. For example, like if you move the interest rates to attract foreign uh, capital inflows, but they don't come, what do you do? You know, um, it's, it's, it's something, it's not an automatic in this time. I think in the, in the modern context, we cannot imagine this, but in this context of the interwar period, all these things are broken, right? So the starting point, and I would quickly run through this very quickly because these things are very detailed, uh, but I want to just maybe give you the, the core idea that I got from chapter three, Hot Money, which is we have a system that's fundamentally broken. What we what we need is a, a stabilization effort that is a, based on the key currency idea. And the key currency idea is that the, the, the currencies that are at the center of the system stabilize with each other. That could happen either that the key currency again stabilizes with gold, that's one option, and the others then, as a consequence, stabilize uh, as using as that's that that's that currency as a as as their reserve, or actually in this modern context, in this 1930s context, the tripartite agreement is that the three key currencies stabilize with each other. And as part of the tripartite agreement, which is sort of the intellectual, the start of really uh, Charlie's career, tripartite is UK, Britain, and United States, was to sort of match gold outflows with ma with gold inflows so we'll make France. sure you said uk and britain sorry uk france and the united states that's what i meant thanks <laughs> um so the agreement basically says that this is essentially a version of central bank cooperation that basically when a country experiences an outflow that will be matched by an official flow the other direction from one of the uh, the, the the core currency or the key currency countries so this would be at least a very simple attempt of stabilizing the core, the core of the system, could that, which then can be used as a reserve to stabilize the rest of the system. So there's this two-tier system that we, we have 
So and they're only sure. stabilizing yeah. it for for 24 hour periods, right? So every 24 hour period, they have a new uh, you know exchange rate. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, this is the tripartite agreement is actually the second best result, or sort of the the not not actually the result people want. The the conference starts out. Let me find the quote here. I had it somewhere. I'm not sure where I put it, but. I think maybe it's later. I, I'm, I'm getting completely confused between the different chapters. But um, the idea that I spelled out earlier was that this conference, the agenda was set out that the countries that have enough abundant gold reserves should start using them and sharing them. The countries that are devaluating have competitive valuation. So the countries that have reserves are US and France. The countries that devalue uh, to attract reserves are Britain. They stop the devaluation process and Germany should stop its exchange controls. So that's basically what the agenda of the World Economic Con Congress is. It's all monetary. It's just a monetary fixing that these flows actually are used at the core together amongst the major countries, that they cooperate with the reserves and share those reserves, then stabilize the rest of the system. We didn't get that uh, grand bargain, but we got the tripartite agreement. Okay, that's that stabilizes things for a little bit. Um, but that's the, I think it already shows us this sort of idea um, that, that exists here, that uh, a core problem is the stabilization one and to the central bank cooperation that is required for the stabilization to occur, right? Especially in this interwar period. So I think that's maybe an important idea. Um, okay. Um, chapter three, things that stand out still are, hmm, we're not getting into a lot, a lot of stuff here that's important, but uh, Perry says throughout this whole chapter that there's a prevalence of fundamental disequilibrium. Okay, um, the here's the quote that I would give us: um, the price system could not be expected to work very much, very well under such conditions. Hence, the necessity of a program of public loans, the necessity to limit those loans to productive purposes in order that their repayment won't be burden too burdensome productive, not only in terms of domestic income, but in terms of foreign exchange earnings. So um, the key thing here is that markets are actually not working. So we cannot work with, this, with the standard logic either of just moving around into interest rates or whatever else. It's actually, I'm not sure where I found that quote, but I'm just trying to see where I have that. But I think the whole point of, was it chapter four already? Now I'm mixing the concepts because the problem of structural disequilibrium also appears in chapter four. Oh, yeah, okay. So what I just mentioned is in chapter four, which is if markets don't work, don't use them. Uh, economists have a misplaced correctness uh, or concreteness on this, on this question. Um, construction of a multilateral system involved a lot more than just leaving things to markets. Basically, that's what Kinoverger said. So. Um, Anyway, I'm not sure if we want to sort of how much time we want to spend because we have five minutes left according to the clock. We have not gotten to chapter four yet, and we're not yet halfway through chapter three. So I'm not sure how you guys want to leave this. I would say chapter four they can be not today. Okay. I think maybe um, maybe uh finish with a few minutes of, of big pic talking about big picture stuff like what are the kind of takeaways that Kindleberger has from all of this and I'm certainly more interested in kind of the theory than I am in the biographical stuff yeah I think chapter four doesn't concern us that much from all the discussions it's the one that's least related from a practical perspective to modern questions. So we can leave out some of the economics there, but I think the key thing is that he was a intelligence um, officer and that was the method that he sort of started adopting later in his later work. I think that's the key takeaway. And um, and I think, you know, the, the discussions of the Marshall Plan are excellent. I think I've really learned a lot. And I think also this sort of big question about these big proposals, what to do with Germany, um, I think this core idea of actually creating an economic floor instead of a, a ceiling, which was the Morgan Morgenthau plan was 
to basically um, deindustrialize Germany and basically put a maximum uh, put Germany into a position where where um, it could actually economically almost not sustain itself um, because pre-war Germany was basically paying for all its food imports and for all its other imports with, with industrial goods. So that was the logic that Kindleberger rejected or that Marshall rejected and says, we have to put a floor, we have to actually reindustrialize Germany so Germany can actually pay for food imports and other imports. So it's just getting the basic economic cycle back going so that Germany actually does not become a huge burden on the United States budget. So that's the main concern for Marshall um, and then restart uh, the process of Germany becoming able to produce. So I think that's maybe the main sort of economic takeaway I would point to that uh, in that section if, you, if we don't get around to discussing it next time. But I think um, I think it's super just super interesting to see um, what experiences he had. Um, and, and that basically he also wasn't in, in the disagreement with the European Payments Union. He thought that was a mistake to to try to amidst, he sort of, we see that later, but the whole Mondo Flaming um, uh, currency area that the European Union should be its own currency area is a misplaced concept. He said, always said we should be emphasizing on Europe's integration into the world rather than Europe's integration within itself. And that's a big, big problem that we still see today. I think we, we can get into that particular uh, issue later. Um, but if you want to point, if you want to go back and do the reading, uh, I'll point you to these big points that uh, stood out to me. Um, but yeah, we have like a, maybe a couple more minutes that we ever go around the, go around. I mean, you can all tell us each of us what stood out to you in this conversation, what you've learned, even if you have not done the reading, you've been in the conversation, you can tell us what was interesting, what stood out to you. Well, now I'm thinking more about the two tiered plan and how that would work and which markets were working and which ones weren't to kind of, I, it's still not clear to me, um, how it would necessarily address the problem that, that Kindleberg is trying to address, but, uh. I have to think more about that. Great. Who wants to go next? Yeah, the fun thing uh, that stood, stood out for me is that uh, the markets uh, most could be like designed, and it's resonated a lot of with my current reading of or rereading of David Graeber's uh, History of Debt. That like just the whole idea that like there is a process of design that it's not emerge like in the perfect form by itself or naturally. Yeah, that's what I like about the book. Yeah, that's interesting because I don't know if Kindleberger would necessarily agree that markets could be designed. He might say that there are um, uh, shocks that can happen that interfere with markets and you can kind of backstop markets. But I think a lot of what he's arguing here is that this is kind of an organic uh, kind of almost Darwinian evolution of markets, and you can create the conditions to allow the markets to succeed almost. Yeah. I'm, yeah, it was maybe um, I used the broad definition of what I mean by the market, but yeah, I, I meant the condition. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, like law and institutions, whatever. Yeah, Nina, you look like you want to say something. Go on, come on. No, actually, on that last point, I mean, uh, it's, uh, yeah, what you've been stressing on the outtake, um, that actually, uh, it's not like a very planned process, um, how it's being like recounted then uh, looking back, but uh, that there's, um, yeah, a lot of unplanned activities and um, also some, yeah, path dependency that's just like really not are broken up easily. That's what I understand, but through those big instances of war then, um, which is also not like, yeah, uh, something I have heard before, but, um, and yeah, other major takeaways. Um, well, a lot of smaller points uh, that I will yeah, delve into afterwards. Um, Oh, but a bit depressing actually at the start, but uh, well, also very interesting. <laughs> I'm I'm curious to read more. Do I need to call on you, or you just jump in, guys? Nicolas, what about you? Yeah, I can go. Um, well, so first, like a more general comment is that, uh, like Alex, um, you know, I'm not that interested in the biographical part. And I've heard a couple of uh, presentations by, by Barry about this book. 
and he was always like emphasizing the, the biographical aspects i think and even he says that in the in, in the preface that this was going to be a book about the dollar and then it ended up being a book about uh, Kindleberger. But so far I'm quite, I mean, I only read the, the four chapters plus the introduction in the preface. And despite chapter one, let's say, I'm quite uh, pleasantly surprised to find a lot of uh, theoretical discussions going on, not only about uh, Kindleberger, but also, you know, about historical aspects or uh, the some his intellectual background, let's say. So that's been that's been great, um, and perhaps like two um, comments on on my end that I that I will continue thinking about throughout the, the reading group. So first, like the to what extent um, a history of the international monetary system is the same as um, a history of the the dollar as as world currency, and what I mean is that. True, and uh, it's in order to understand the international monetary system, you need to understand the, the international role of the dollar. But that's like half of the picture. Then you also have to understand what is the role of all the other currencies, let's say, and how they play with uh, the dollar around. And a little bit of that is what we discussed today with the, these controls. So I'm happy to see that Kindleberger was also thinking about that and not just, you know, doing an um, a discussion of, of the international role of the dollar instead of a discussion of the international monetary system, which has the dollar as key currency, but also hundreds of currencies as well. Um, and one last point is also one thing that Alex mentioned at some point um, about how Kindleberger saw the, the global economy as a single economy with one currency. And I think this also plays out in more recent discussions on, on monetary theory with the Chartalist and near chartalist slash MMT camp saying that money is national, you know, because given the role of the state and so on, against other heterodox approaches like the Marxists that say money is world, uh, world money, first of all. And then uh, it's interesting also to see how Kindleberger and, and, and these guys were perhaps coming from a different theoretical tradition, also reaching, you know, certain results. Uh, or conclusions that um, you know the the money in the system is also uh, is always you know world money. But yeah, that's that's those are my my takes so far. Claudio, do you have anything to add? Well, uh, I can say that uh, <clears throat> uh, two things. One is that uh, the, the idea of Willis or Williams of uh, the key currencies, uh, I think uh, it's very important in the Bretton Woods agreement because actually there were uh, two plants, the Keynes plan and the White plan, but also the, the William plan. This is that of... Uh, key currencies because in Bretton Woods uh, the, the uh, what uh, did the disagreement uh, it, it is to to stabilize the the, the parity of the currencies uh, uh, according to the power uh, uh, economic but also political power of the uh, countries uh, in uh, involved uh, involved in this uh, agreement and the other thing is that the, the title of the book money empire uh, uh, remind me the uh, the book of marcello de Cecco, money and empire that uh, was talking it is a book of uh, 1974 and uh, is about uh, the uh, the gold standard and the Checo says that uh, it's a sterling standard and it's it's, it's based not uh, on market uh, market mechanism but uh, on the power relationships uh, on imperialism on the fact that uh, England was the 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 most uh, powerful power and uh, uh, could um, uh, use uh, its, its power to to 
to act as a center, a financial center of, of the system. Uh, yes, that's the same for the United States uh, after uh, World War II. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because the Bre Bretton Woods doesn't really say anything about key currencies, but it's set up in a way that's compatible with key currencies, right? Um, key currencies are allowed to exist within the Bretton Woods system uh, because, you know, you can either peg to gold or you can peg to a currency that, that is pegged to gold. Um, so if you're living in a world that already has a key currency, you can slap something like Bretton Woods rules on there uh, without really changing much. And I think that's part of the argument uh, that Perry is making in this book. Um, and maybe that Kindleberger kind of subscribed to that that uh, Bretton Woods was largely just window dressing uh, or a formalization of a system that was already there or something like that, uh, or to make it look more bilateral and more kind of, you know, everyone's equal, that kind of thing, uh, even though, because that's how the language is written, but it's compatible with, you know, a hierarchy emerging. So I'll I'll call just, the next I don't know, don't know if, or, yeah, yeah. Let, let's let's conclude with the last two comments quickly, and then we we're way over time. But that's I think it's worth hearing everybody out. Okay. Well, um, it was nice to see some of the things um, that I actually recognized from the MOOC, and uh, like the the shift from uh, sort of budgets, world well, short term debt towards um, long term but shiftable debt, so different kinds of liquidity and stuff. Um, still kind of confused about like how or why there would be two or 13 different exchange rates within one country, but uh, we're probably too over time to talk about that now. Yeah, thanks for this conversation. I think I'm leaving with more questions and answers, but um, <laughs> yeah, I think, um, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, the questions I have written, but then I need to get back to the book, so maybe uh, they'll be answered. There is uh, the following. So, ah, yes, uh, yeah, Jay mentioned the, the seasonal fluctuation in money demand in the US. I have an intuition of why that might be, but I, I, I wanted to know why. Um, and then, ah, yes, uh, yeah, just understanding the better the mechanism of how the, the first world war you know uh, kind of brought the u.s money markets stash capital markets together um yeah and the in eternal question that i have but that i haven't researched properly and that i never have a proper answer for is um yeah how, how when and how exactly did we switch from you know pound you know the the pound being the dominant currency to the us dollar and i guess this was incremental and uh, happened sometime between world war one and the end of world war ii but i i never had like a proper answer so um, maybe we can discuss this next time thank you everyone well, good questions. Thanks so much, everybody, for your conversation. I'm not sure if Asker was also saying his final words, but he will he can reserve them for next time. We meet again in two weeks. Um, bring your friends. Uh, do the readings if you can. Um, we'll be continuing to add to these notes just to help us get around uh, all the questions that we have. Perry will probably join us the Wednesday after that, which is right before Christmas. And don't forget to submit any work you have for the Money View Symposium. Um, I know some of you have been writing papers or been working on things that uh, are worth discussing in, in, in the wider context. So um, we're all working towards that as well. But with that, if I don't see you, happy holidays. Uh, and otherwise, be in touch and see you guys in two weeks. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.